Unity is defined by Webster's Dictionary as a condition of harmony, the quality or state of being made one. God intended for us as believers to be one. But what does it mean to be united and how is that a reflection of creation? How does this explain the purpose of God's creation story? Welcome back to another episode of Shabbat Night Live, again with Bill Cloud from Shorashi Ministries and our very own Rude Crew member, Alvaro Martinez. We're glad to have you back, gentlemen. We're glad to be back. Especially on this hot topic. On this hot topic? I think so. <laughs> I, I mean, hot I, topics. I learned a lot last week. We didn't even leave the first or second day of creation. No, we, not really. <laughs> no, oh, well, we did bounce around a little bit, but yeah. Okay. Well, you know, there's there's a lot there. And, and it, it goes back to something I said in the previous program. The creation account <clears throat> is not just a history of what happened. It, it is that, but it's so much more than that. It's a pattern for everything that we see coming after. And, um, you know, I talked about how, you know, the, the child and being conceived in the womb and how it has to go through the process and everything. Right. Every child that's conceived and born is a microcosm of the creation account. It's, it's, there's a pattern that is established. And if we can understand that, then we can see it applies to a lot of different things, a lot of different, um, well, eschatology, prophecy. Because at the close of the last program, I said something like this and kind of dropped another hand grenade and we left. You and know. of course, we have to leave then. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I said, I believe that we're living in the prophetic third day. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, when did he call forth that grass, that herb yielding seed? the trees that bear fruit is in, whose seed is in itself. It was on the third day, not the second, not the fourth, but on the third day. So <clears throat> we were talking about that in relation to having to be born again of the incorruptible yep. seed, the Messiah, mm -hmm. right? Who is the word and ha how the seed already contains what it needs. It just needs to germinate, grow, go through the process until it comes to fruition. That is true for an individual but I also suggest that it is true for the body at large. If we have truly received him, the seed already contains everything it needs. So in the beginning, the seed, you pointed it out in the last program, as I was reading that, right. you know, it, the seed was already there. Right. That's why it doesn't say he created the grass, right. he called forth the grass. Seed was already there. But why on the third day? So that's why I said I believe we're living in the prophetic third day. You go back and, and just do a, a word search on third day in the Bible. Here's some highlights. When Abraham was taking Isaac up to Mount Moriah or to the land of Moriah to offer Isaac there, in Genesis 22, it was on the third day that he lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. Mm -hmm. When Esther goes in to the king to begin the process of revealing what Haman is trying to do, it was on the third day that she did this. And of course, when the Messiah was resurrected, it third was day. on the third day. Oh, wow. So there is a concept that goes all the way back to the beginning that those things, the seed, if I can put it that way, that's been hidden in the ground, so to speak, God typically calls it forth on the third day. How beautiful. Right. right. So we follow this pattern all the way through. Now let me read you a text here um, from Hosea chapter six, and I thought I had marked it because I'm in this new Bible, and like I said, I, I, for some reason I can't find anything in a new Bible. All right, <clears throat> Hosea chapter six. This is what is gonna be said, and this is after God has, in Hosea chapter one, talked about how he was going to take and uh, with his people and they were gonna be uh, scattered. And so right. Hosea has a son by the, the woman Gomer mm -hmm. called Jezreel or Yezreel, which means to scatter. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm gonna scatter you for your, your transgressions. Right. But Yezreel also means to sow, S-O-W. Correct. Correct. So you imagine the guy out there in the parable of the sower. What is he mm -hmm. sowing? Seed. How is he sowing it? He's scattering. scattering. Right. Mm -hmm. He's not poking a hole in the ground. He's scattering the seed. That's why yeah. fall, some falls on the wayside. Some falls among the, thorn, uh, the thorns and thistles. Some falls on stony ground. But some falls on good ground, right? Yeah. 
So you with me so far? Correct. So when he scattered them, he also Planted sowed them. them. Right. All right. And in the beginning, when he sowed seed, what day did he call it forth? Third the day. third day. All right. Also, this uh, it goes on. Hosea one talks about how that the after the son Yezreel, he has the daughter Loruchma. Mm-hmm. I won't show them any mercy. And then the son Loami, you're not going to be my people. But then turns right around and says. But in the place that was said of you, you are not my people. You will be called the sons of the living God. Mm-hmm. All right? So that kind of establishes some context mm-hmm. for what is said in Hosea chapter 6. Verse 1, it says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. When is he going to do this? After two days. Well, if it's after two days, what day does that put us on? Third. And so he says, on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Wow. Now, <clears throat> so what do I mean by I believe we're living in the prophetic third day? Messiah said on the eve of his crucifixion, unless a grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies, it won't produce any fruit. Right. All right, so he's the grain of wheat that goes into the ground and dies, so to speak. The, he's called forth from the tomb on the third day, right? But that initiates something, right. right? He sends his disciples out into the whole world to be witnesses of him. So that, in terms of years, was about 2,000 years ago, mm. right? We know, according to Psalm, and Peter reiterates this, that a day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 yes. years is as one day. So how many days have passed? Well, two days. Two. two. Which right. brings us to the third. Third, day. third day. So what is the Creator doing? I believe he's speaking and he's calling forth all that seed that he's planted, all of these believers right. that have received the Messiah. And I'm talking genuinely now. I'm not talking about people who identify as a Christian ethnically right. because of what country they live in. You understand what I mean? Yes. Yeah. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about relationship. I'm talking about right. people who have received the Messiah and haven't yet come to understand some of the things that you and I have, have been privileged to come to understand. Are you, are you following no, me? No, yeah, and this is beautiful because what that shows, and Hosea is specifically talking about the 10 northern tribes of Israel, but that, this, is on, this is not only that he scattered them throughout the world as punishment, but also as planting That's exactly to right. be that light to the world that Israel was called to be, but they didn't want to. They wanted it to keep it for them. And it was just personal, so he had to scatter them for them to go and be a light, which is what they were called to do, uh, whether they liked it or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> and, and so now here we are, you know, after 2,000 years, we're coming into that prophetic third day. He's beginning to speak, and he spoke to you. Right. And however it come about, you come to realize some things. Right. All right, same with you, same with me, Michael. Others, people who are watching right now, however it came to be, it's because we're living in that season. We're living in that time. Right. Now, that is going to segue into the whole concept of unity, or I love the way you you put it, harmony. Harmony. You think about people who sing, who have groups, yes. and they harmonize. But they're all different. All different parts, mm-hmm. right? Sounds and... Right. Octaves and alto, uh, altos, sopranos, tenors, baritone, bass, and people like me just stand there because <laughs> I can't sing for anything. Well, they don't hear. But, they, but what we're emphasizing here is everybody does their part. That's right. This guy is not supposed to be singing this guy's part because if he does, that's not harmony. Right. That is not a harmony. So. Everyone is doing their part. How do, how do we see this in the creation account? God said, let there be light. He separated the light from the darkness, the day from the night. He established the firmament. He divided the waters above from the waters below. Mm-hmm. He gathered the seas together in one place so that the dry land could appear so that he could call forth mm-hmm. all the grass, the herb yielding seed, the trees that bear fruit whose seed is in itself. He established the greater light to rule the day. He established the lesser light to rule the night. And one doesn't encroach on the other. Everything is in its place 
doing what it was designed to do, functioning in its purpose. And when everything is all said and done and everything is in their assigned position doing what they were designed to do, he said it was good. He said, this is good. Everything's working in harmony. Mm -hmm. It's echad. Mm -hmm. It's different. Different. There's a lot of different things. There's various and unique qualities and components to his creation. But when it's where, or let me now get to this point, when they're where they're supposed to be, doing what they were designed to do, that's how we can have unity. So we're living in the prophetic third day. I believe that with my whole heart. He's speaking. He's calling forth all this hidden seed. People are like, I never saw that before. (laughs) We're supposed to keep the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. Wow, I never realized that we as Christians are supposed to keep these feast days. I'm coming to understand that all of his book is for all of his people. How come I didn't see that before? Mm -hmm. Better yet, how come my God-fearing, saintly grandmother didn't see this in her day? My opinion, because it wasn't time. It wasn't the time, correct. It wasn't time. Mm -hmm. So the season is changing, God is speaking, and in conjunction with calling forth all that hidden seed, He's also calling for his people to become one, to be in harmony with one another. It doesn't mean the same. We're not talking about uniformity. That is not what he calls us to be. What do I mean by that? Well, I believe in this calendar. I believe you say the name this way, and I believe the day begins on this, and I believe this, this, and if you don't believe what I believe, or you don't see it the way I see it, or you don't celebrate it exactly the way I celebrate it, then you're doing it all wrong. Okay, we said something in the previous program more along these lines. There are some things the Creator tells us to do that He is not specific about how to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In some things, He's very vague, very ambiguous. Shabbat, once again, for, to use that as the example, right. how many instructions does He give us in the Scripture about if you do this, 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 and this, then you've successfully kept the Shabbat? Right. Very few. He doesn't right. do that. He doesn't give us a formula, which then leads me to think, he must want me to really kind of go to him exactly, and be guided by his spirit and how to do this. That's where relationship takes precedence. Okay. Does that give latitude then for another person who's in relationship with him, for him to say, now I want you to do this? Mm Mm-hmm without transgressing his commandments, without walking outside of the boundaries, does it give latitude for me to see something a little differently than you? Okay, you understand what I'm trying yeah, to yeah, say? Yeah, I'm not talking about the, the fundamentals. I'm not talking about those things that are set in concrete. Right. I'm talking about those things that... Are left to interpretation. Right, and ultimately, we need to be guided by the Spirit and how to walk these Amen. things out. And okay? I believe the Father tells us that, and let's, let's us know, especially the Sabbath being one example, being so vague in, into what we do or not do, uh, I believe that, like the scripture talks about, uh, it says that, that uh, sometimes the, our conscience condemns us, condemns us and sometimes it, uh, you know, it defends us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I believe that Sabbath is a great example because I get that question a lot uh, in the Hispanic ministry. It's like, how do we keep Sabbath? Well, you know the basics, you know the, the don't work and don't make any other, anybody else work. But other than, from then on, let the Father guide you. Yes. And he'll, he'll, he'll let you know, the Spirit will let you know if you're doing something wrong That's with Shabbat, right. mm-hmm. and he will let you know if you're not, if you're doing what you're doing, it's, it's, it's fine. Well, <clears throat> when, when we look at all the components of the creation, you know, and, and Paul elaborates on this later, right. you know, he talks about the different members, you know, mm-hmm. but we're all part of the same body. But it's important for people to understand that unity does not mean uniformity. And Correct. in the Hebraic Roots Movement, in general, there, have, there has been this inclination to kind of position ourselves to say to others, if you don't think this way, believe this way, do things this way, then you're really not part of the body. Right. Well, and Michael was a big believer and not, um, you know, not accepting unity at any cost. And I know you are too, Bill. Um, you know, we don't accept unity at any cost, no. but we res- we respectfully agree to disagree on certain subjects, but we get the core of it the same. Yeshua is king, right. Lord and savior. 
Um, I don't believe in unity at any cost because there are some things that I cannot compromise on. That's right. right. And Messiah is one of is them. One, is the one, right. quite frankly. Right. Should be you know, probably the uh, only one, but well, it's, and Torah. it's the one. Yeah, and, and if you love him, keep his commandments. Mm-hmm. All right, then walking out those commandments, though, mm-hmm. right. and how to do that and you know what not to do, that is where we need to be gracious enough as he has been gracious to me. Right. Amen. Be gracious enough to let people grow and mature as the Spirit guides them. Right? right? Is yes. that, do you agree with that? Absolutely. I, right. I used to be a Torah terrorist myself. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we all get excited. We right. do. We get zealous. We're Joseph. We're running to our brothers and saying, hey, guess what God has shown me? Right. And then they throw us into the pit and we get mad. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I do not believe in unity at any cost. There are some things we cannot unite with. There are some things that we cannot link arms with people. Mm -hmm. We are not to be unequally yoked. Agreed. But when people are that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that's the foundation. Mm -hmm. I can can companion with that person. I, I can companion with those that say, you know, we need to be obedient. We need to be led by the Spirit of God. We need to do what the Father is telling us to do. I can, you know... I can unite with that. Some people, when they say unity, um, or if I say unity, some people think I'm saying, oh, we just need to all come together, tolerate everything, right. embrace everything, and everybody just get together, hold hands, and sing kumbaya. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. You know, you know, I'm not gonna get into the details of it. You know there are some, there are certain things that I just don't do or won't do. Yes. Or, or I have some boundaries. And we respect that. Right. Right. But we all have those boundaries. We should have those boundaries. Right. Just like the Father provided the Torah to be a boundary for us. Right. And our walk with Him. Right. Right. So, you know, I'm with Michael on this. I don't believe in unity at any cost. Mm -hmm. But I do believe in unity of the faith. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that we are called to unite under the banner of the Messiah. And Him as our King. Because this isn't all, you know, it isn't about my ministry or this ministry or any other ministry. It's not about about, us. It's about his purposes. And so he's the king. It's about being a light. Right. Well, right. And it's not being about, you know, a bunch of fireflies going their own different direction. Mm -hmm. It's about about being that city set upon a hill that Mm -hmm. cannot be hidden. A lot of people will use the, you know, the the cause of unity or the call for unity. They'll use that as opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, to to do things that maybe aren't so um, righteous and virtuous. You know, so I, I want to be clear about that. That I'm on the same page with Michael there. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in unity at any cost. At the same time, we still have an obligation. Yes, and Michael, we've seen a big change in him in accepting that obligation as a forefront leader in the mm-hmm. Hebrew Roots movement. Not only to unite with more with other Hebrew roots teachers, but also in the Christian community. Right. Because well, how are we going to be a light? We're supposed to be a light to the Christian community. That way, they can come into Torah and, and, and walk it out. But if we just hide ourselves in our groups and just keep it like Israel did at the beginning, they just wanted to keep it theirs. Well, then then we're not being a light. We're just keeping the, the light to ourselves and we're not sharing it when we're supposed to be sharing that light. That's right. I would say that, yeah. you know, reading the Gospels, I found that Yeshua spent as much time with the sinner and the drunkard yeah, yeah. and the tax collector as he did with his disciples. Correct. Well, and it's not the, the healthy that need the that physician. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Well, I want, you said something, and if I'm if you're okay with this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to this. Okay. You know, you, you I'm said... I'm scared, but okay. No, no, no. <laughs> no, you said that Michael is, well, how did, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Okay. But, you know, Michael is is changing or adjusting or yes. renewing uh, his vision of, of how he sees that, you know, the body needs to be, and as, as a leader, mm-hmm. his responsibility in this. And is that an accurate yes. interpretation of what you said? Yes. Okay. Likewise, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the Father has put me in the place and position that I'm in. I didn't ask for it. it just kind of happened. And here I am. So whether I like it or not, I have a responsibility. Mm-hmm. And we're grateful that you like it. Well, <laughs> You're liking you. it, right? <laughs> well, no, I, I would like to use my and Michael's developing relationship 
is an example of what we're talking about here, okay? Mm -hmm. Michael um, has a disposition, has a delivery, has a personality that is very, what's the word I'm looking for here? Different than yours. Different than mine. <laughs> yes, but um, our partners enjoy. Right. And so. Right, and, and I'll, I will confess that some years ago, I just, you know, that wasn't my thing. You know, it didn't really, it didn't really appeal to me. Um, and I told Michael this, you know, uh, when we got together here about a year and a half ago, you know, that, you know, really, the way you did things weren't, it wasn't really my cup of tea, mm -hmm. all right? But at the same time, when you called and Michael extended the invitation to me to come and be part of the Yom Teru event year before last, I, I really felt like God spoke to me and said, you need to do this. You need to do this. And, and I have to admit that it was kind of, for me, going out on a limb, you know, because he was so different. And I'm, I'm, I'm not that kind of a presenter, I guess well, you'd say. And he was going out on a limb too because... Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly my point, is that he was taking a risk, I was taking a risk, but when we got together, here's what I saw in Michael. I, I can't speak for what he saw in me, but here's what I saw in Michael. Beyond the bravado, beyond the passion, I saw a person who had a heart for people. Mm -hmm. And I realized, and there was a young man that would gave a testimony at the Circle of the Wagons. It was a young man that gave a testimony. And that testimony really moved me. And here's what I, or here's what the Father really impressed upon me, is that there are people out there in the world that need the Michael Roots of the That's world. That's right. Yep. There are people who need, well, I'd like to think need the Bill Clouds of the there world. There are. Mm -hmm. There are people who need the Billy Grahams yes. of the world. There are people who need the Perry Stones of the world. Mm -hmm. There are different and unique people out there, and the Creator has given certain personalities and people certain abilities, a personality that can connect with right. somebody that I would never connect with. And right. everything is in seasons as well. Right. Like I know 10 years ago, I wanted the, the heavy meat, the Michael Roots. And yeah. now I'm at a point in my life where I need more and, and more of the uh, relationship um, kind of advice type, like how to be mm. a better wife, how to be a, a better um, daughter, mm. you know, how to live a better life as a friend even. And everything is in seasons, you know, just because that's where you start doesn't mean that's where you're going to end. And you mature in your faith. Yes. When you come into Torah, at the beginning, most of us are very hard-headed, you know, strong and, and, and hit people over the head. But then we grow in our faith mm -hmm. and we become more, we give more faith, uh, uh, more grace, I'm sorry, uh, to people. So, yeah, I, I believe it's in seasons, our, our growth, but we got to continue being that light. Uh, that we're called to be, that Israel was called to be. Yes. Well, <clears throat> well, I want to I want to brag on this ministry here, Rude Awakening, and Michael and you and Ted and, and others, that you are setting an example. Well, thank you. That we need to come together. We we have our differences. We're always going to have our differences. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to see things differently. Look, Michael and I are never going to agree on everything. No. You know, sometimes I don't agree with myself. You know, <laughs> there are cassette tapes floating around out there that have my name on it. I'd like to get those things back. You know, but again, that's maturity. You're right. learning new concepts and new ideas, and right. you're reading. You know, what we learned about Genesis, most of it were were aha moments for me. Just learning, even here on on stage. Um, so we're constantly constantly learning, and that's why it's a relationship. Right. You know, we're never right. going to know everything. Right. Well, Adapting to our new, rev the new revelations, which is a, like a great example is what's happening with the name. A, pe a lot of people are giving Michael uh, a hard time because he used to say Yahweh, now he's saying Yehovah, but well, new revelations. I respect a person that's willing to put his name on the line and change because of the new revelation he received and what he believes to be truth, even though it was going to affect his ministry. So that takes guts and that takes courage and that takes well, a man of integrity. And, and, and the fact that he would invite somebody like me or, you know, try to reach out to other ministries. And, and we're not here, you know, just to applaud Michael no. necessarily, right. although give credit where credit is due. But what we are here saying is that we're not just saying this, you know, just to be saying something. Right. We're actually trying to walk this out right. mm -hmm. and learn how to come together in harmony. 
not compromising who and what we are, not necessarily saying I agree with everything you you are saying or vice versa, but we had come together on those things that are common and foundational and we lock arms and mm -hmm. that's the kind of, uh, that's what we need to demonstrate in the body and the body needs to respond in like kind because we are living in the prophetic third day. He is calling forth all this seed that he has scattered. How can we, and I know we're running short on time on this segment, but let me get this in. Hebraic roots people have tended, tended to kind of sequester themselves away from contact with those Christians or that group over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. That is not what the Messiah has called us no, to do. That's not what he set an example for us to do. No, no. And so we've got to learn to come together in harmony and unite, not be uniform, but to unite and have that true unity that comes from above. Because see, we've got a job to do. That's right. There's right. something we're supposed to be doing here. There's a, we were given this insight and understanding of the feasts and the Sabbath and the things written in the Torah, not to just puff our heads up, right but to fill our lives so that we can go out and be true and faithful ambassadors of the Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. That's what we're called to do. That's Amen. right. The Almighty created all things with purpose, and we are the caretakers of those purposes. But when we lose our focus on Him, the evil one can sneak in and plant His purposes, the tear that takes over and destroys like a weed. I don't believe the Creator planted the tree of the knowledge of I believe that's the tear. In a special guest teaching on Shabbat Night Live, The Wheat and the Tears, Bill Cloud explains our awesome responsibility to guard the purposes of Yehovah and how to avoid sleeping on the job, allowing the enemy to take over. Messiah said this, every plant that my father has not planted, he's going to pluck it up. Get this eye-opening two-episode teaching on DVD, Blu-ray, or USB as seen on Shabbat Night Live. The Wheat and the Tares with special guest Bill Cloud. Order now by phone or online. We're enjoying a wonderful conversation on the very topic of unity and where the church is today. Um, and so thank you so much, Bill, for being with us, Alvaro, for joining us uh, on this conversation. We planned it in a way that we would have Bill join us, um, but Alvaro as well, because he used to work for a former Hebrew Roots organization, um, and I've worked with another formal one as well, and so we have a lot of uh, experience in, in this realm um, on this topic. And I do want to highlight one thing, and that is, um, you know, I, I came from a splinter of the Worldwide Church of God, which is where I essentially learned the basics of Torah, which they were the basics, mm -hmm. um, but, and, and I've been in ministry for a very long time, so I volunteered with them, and I did a lot of work for them. Um, and then worked at A Root Awakening in another organization. And what I noticed, just from being on the inside, but also being on the outside as a congregation member and um, a churchgoer, is that, and this is what my mandate was coming back to A Root Awakening. Um, when I did, I did leave for a year and explore the world and then came back, is that, you know, we, there's six billion people in the world that we have to reach. We have to reach the atheists, the, the Jews, the Buddhists, the um, Islamics. And there's no way to do that without being unified, without you know holding each other up and, and forming a charge. Wow. You know, individually we won't be as powerful. That's right. Um, That's right. We can only do it together as, as, a, as one, like you said, which was the whole point of most of this Genesis account that we've been doing with you, Bill, is that we, you know, come as one. You know, there are so many different examples in Scripture of, of things that the Creator told Israel to do. And if you just look at the surface, you'll miss it. You know, if you just, own, if you don't really go, why? Okay, I understand the how, but the why did He say to do this? For instance, the tabernacle. You know, you think about all the different components of the tabernacle, bars, beams, screens, bales, tents, all of those different things. And, and Moses is given this pattern and Moses erects the tabernacle according to the pattern. Now, 
if you could be transported back to the wilderness 3,500 years ago, and you had 24 seven, uh, or, or it's not 24 seven, but uh, 24 hour access to the tabernacle. You could go anywhere you want to, see anything you want to. What is one of the first things you want to see? Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies, of course. It's the number you, one place in my mind. Exactly, <laughs> you want to go see the Ark of the Covenant, you want to see the Holy of Holies. And we, once we see that, we'll get around to looking at the, the menorah and the labor and all mm -hmm. these different things. All right. <clears throat> Where would the golden and bronze clasp be on your list? All the way in the back, probably. Yeah. All the way in the back, probably, yeah. if you thought about it. If, right. That's what I was going to say. I, I didn't even consider them. Okay. All right, here's my point. You read the account of the sanctuary and all the components that had to be crafted in order for there to be a tabernacle. And, and remember, what is the purpose? What's the function of the tabernacle? That I might dwell among them, allow me to put it this way, that I might be one with my people and they might be one with me, mm -hmm. okay? So that's the purpose of the sanctuary. You read all of the different components. All of them need to be where they're supposed to be. Some of them stand out a lot more than others. Mm -hmm. Some of them you don't even notice. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that it's only the bronze and the golden class, when it speaks of those things, does the Creator speak of the tabernacle as being echad, one? Wow. Because without the bronze and golden class, the Ark of the Covenant is no value. Mm -hmm. The menorah means nothing. The labor means nothing. If the tabernacle isn't held together and, and becomes, if it doesn't become one, then the Spirit of God never shows up to inhabit the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And if the Spirit of God is not in that tabernacle, residing among His people, then the tabernacle serves no purpose. Mm -hmm. It's only a tent with expensive furnishings because without His presence there, it really doesn't matter. That's why the tabernacle was destroyed at Shiloh. That's why the Ark of the Covenant was taken captive in 1 Samuel 4. That's why the temple that Solomon dedicated and when the, the presence of God resided in the Holy of Holies, the priest could not stand to minister. But later on, that very temple is destroyed by the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. Why? Because his presence wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So what am I saying? The presence, for the presence of the Creator to be in us, among us, we have to be one. Now we can go and do our own thing. But we're not gonna get anywhere. We're not gonna really do what we've been placed here to do. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of <clears throat> to just tag on to what you had said as you opened, you talk about the, the million, or excuse me, the billions of people out there that we're commissioned yes. to be a witness to. I want you to consider this. When Messiah in John chapter 17, which by the way, I really believe John 17 is the Lord's prayer. But he says this. He's praying for his disciples. He's praying for his people. And he says in verse 20 of John chapter 17, I do not pray for these alone, speaking of those 11 that were there with him. I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. In other mm -hmm. words, indirectly, he's talking, well, no, directly. He's talking right. about you and me. Right. Yes. Because you and I are here, we're believers because tracing it on back, yes. it started out with those guys that right. he was praying for right then, mm -hmm. all right? So I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. And here's what he's praying. That they all may be one. Mm. That was his prayer. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you. Intimate relationship. Inseparable. Even though the Father is, you know, and the Son are these distinct, unique components of the Godhead, if I may use that term. Yet they're one. One is in the other. So that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they collectively also may be one in us. Here's why. That the world may believe that you sent me. Amen. Do you know what that really says? Here's why the world doesn't believe the Father sent the Son. We're because we're not one. We're not one. So this is not just something that if I get around to it, right. you know, no. 
This is directly related to what our commission and mandate as believers is. We are to be witnesses of him. We, if I be lifted up, he said, I will draw all men unto me. Mm -hmm. But what is my responsibility? I'm to lift him up. Mm -hmm. I've got to go out into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth and to be a witness of the resurrected Messiah. And I'm supposed to do it with you and you, and collectively we're supposed to be that witness together because until we are one, apparently, the world's not gonna believe that the Father sent the Son. And so the things that are going on in the world out there, you know, the world does what the world does, but it really, it, the responsibility falls back on me. Right. Yes. It falls back on you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Annie, this is why, this is why I wanted to come and be part of what you know Michael's doing because I recognized in Michael that you know beyond you know the presenter on the TV there's a man who has a heart and he surrounded himself with people who have a heart for people. Mm -hmm. I that's saw right. that and that's what I'm joining with. And those are the kind of people that I want to lock arms with that have a heart for people and would humble themselves and what they want to do and how they want to be, they would humble themselves because we need to come together and have a heart for people, not at any cost, right. but for the right cause. That's and, right. And it's okay? important that, that the leaders, as yourselves, start that because you guys are and, setting the example for everybody else. That's right. And that, you know, we, the little people, no, no, no I wouldn't the, say that. No, no, no but we <clears throat> even just as people, right also recognize that we have a responsibility. Right. It's not the leaders, it, we're collective as one to carry out this mandate, this responsibility to reach the unbeliever. And we can't simply do it, you know, again by ourselves. Right. But, you know, together there's endless possibilities of what we're capable of doing. Yeah, well, we're all different. Like, mm -hmm. Take me for example, I come from a different background, Bill comes from a different background, you come from a different background. Imagine everybody together under the same banner of the Messiah, of Yeshua and his Torah, being a light to the world. Yes. And what does the scripture say? That, that Israel was supposed to be such a light that the nations will come and knock on their door and ask about their, to, telling them to tell me about your God because we mm -hmm. see the blessing. We see, but it comes to Israel being a hot, the people being a hot. And Israel, yeah. is, of course, is, is all those that follow Messiah and believe in him and are grafted into the, uh, the olive tree, Israel. And aside from, you know, just the basic principles of Torah, we should be loving and forgiving, Amen. Amen. kind and generous and, you know, very, um, just a very different people, a people that, you know, where love conquers, love does conquer all, that we are able to um, appreciate each other. Right. Well, <clears throat> when you, you talked about how people would come, tell me about your God. Mm -hmm. People are born with this inherent attraction to light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are, are drawn to things that shine. We're drawn to things that sparkle. It, it's just there. And so I don't think it's an accident that we're supposed to be the light right. of the world because the Creator designed every human being with this attraction right. for what is light. Now, that also in my mind anyway, explains why the adversary comes posing as yes. a messenger of mm -hmm. light. Right. Because he knows that. Now, how is it that he is successful drawing people away from or into something that's false? It's because by and large, God's people have not come into the fruition of being what we were called to be. When he, when he called forth that light and when he spoke and said, let there be light, and, that, and he separated the light from the darkness in the day and the night, and he said, it was good. It was where it was supposed to be. It was doing what it was supposed to be doing. You think of Israel and the mandate to be that light to the nations. Think about where the land of Israel is in terms of the rest of the world. It's not in some far remote corner of the world. Mm -hmm. It's in the midst mm -hmm. of the nations. The Mediterranean Sea, its western border, is tells this. It's, the Mediterranean means Middle Earth. It's in the midst of the earth. Look at the neighborhood. Right. <laughs> it's surrounded by spiritual darkness. Now, why did God put his people in the middle of the earth, surrounded by enemies, and call them to be a light? 
The cup was supposed to be a light right. in the midst of the darkness. You prepare a table for me, where? Not among my friends and those who agree with me and who do the Sabbath the way I think it should be done. Yeah. You prepare a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we are to be that light and imagine what it would be. Imagine what would happen in this world if you and I could lay our own agendas right. and will aside, our own desires aside and say, you know, because we have this common relationship and covenant with the creator of the universe through his son, Messiah, the Yeshua, we need to work together. We need to mm -hmm. be an example to the world right. and to the body. Because coming together in unity, and again, I want to stress this, not uniformity. Right. Correct. Right. Unity. That we do not endorse uniformity. Right. Unity, not uniformity. To do that requires me to die to myself. Mm -hmm. For a greater purpose. Right. For it's, him. It has to say, Bill, you think this way, you see things this way, you don't particularly like this, but here is the master's agenda. Mm -hmm. That's right. Are you willing to say no to you long enough to advance his cause and his purpose? That's what unity is going to require. Um, where are we on time? Because I wanted to read something here real quick. You have if plenty I of time. Okay. Psalm 133. Now, probably every Messianic Hebrew Roots congregation, at least at some point in their worship service, some point during the year, they're going to sing Hine Matov. You know, I mean, it's a song, if you're not familiar with it, it's a Hebrew song. It's taken from Psalm 133. Hine Matov Umanaim, Shevet Achim Gam Yachat. How good. And how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. We're going we're gonna to dwell together in unity. How have we demonstrated that? Hmm. How well has that worked? Well, I only have to look out the world and see, by and large, they don't believe the Father has sent the Son. So what does that tell me? Mm, we haven't quite gotten there right. yet. Mm -hmm. All right? But it is a good and it is a pleasant thing for brethren to dwell together not in uniformity, not being exactly alike, not having the same view about what women should wear, shouldn't wear, head coverings, when a day, all these different things. Zit zits or... How long they should be. Shabbat. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> all right. We all agree that what he commanded we're to do, right. mm -hmm. but a lot of us have you know, a different way of looking at things. You grew up in the worldwide Church of God. Well, <clears> I <throat> that's where I found Torah. That's so where you found Catholic. Torah then. Okay, so. so that was your background, mm -hmm. and you had that slant on things. Yes. See, I grew up in the Church of God. We weren't so much about the Torah. We were about the Spirit. I was going to say right. the Spirit. Okay? Right. <laughs> we were about those things. But now, wait a minute. I think I read that the Father is searching for true worshipers Amen. who worship Him in what? Spirit, Spirit and, and truth. in truth. So it's not an accident that He would pull somebody with your background and with somebody like me, my background and your background, and pull us together with our different views, yeah. different ways of looking at right. things, different perspectives, and then say, okay, now be one. Mm -hmm. All right? He's trying to make a point here. Right. That's right. And one of the things he's trying to say to us is, Bill, Annie, you know, Alvaro, get over yourselves. Yep. There's a greater purpose. That's right. If you're going to be my follower, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to get over yourselves and you're going to have to listen to what I've got to, what I've got to say here. And I have a scary point, which you were talking about earlier, is you know, the spirit of God will eventually leave <clears throat> if the holy place is corrupted. That's right. So if we you know, allow ourselves to be corrupted, I mean, eventually that spirit will leave us. Um, and nothing gets done without the Spirit of God. Right. That's right. When, when man was formed, <clears throat> he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. Then he became a living soul. Mm -hmm. Not before. Mm -hmm. The form was there, but the function wasn't. The purpose was not able to be fulfilled until God breathed the breath of life into him, until he put his spirit within him. And likewise, you and I individually, collectively, we will not fulfill his purposes in this earth 
unless his spirit is in us, mm -hmm. unless his spirit is among us and guiding and directing us, and unless we're willing to respond. And that's to, the key, because we all have the, the, the choice, just like, like Adam did at mm -hmm. the beginning. Yeah. We all have the spirit of God in us. Every, everybody in the world has the spirit of God in them, but it's, he's calling his sheep, but are they gonna listen and follow? That's right. And if we don't, and this is what Annie was really getting at here, if we don't, if we continue to say, no, 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 I'm gonna have it my way. I'm gonna do it my way. How long will he abide with that? Right. We need to come together, learn how to come together in un true unity of the faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To know that there's, For his purpose. That there's bigger fresh fish to fry, right. you know, than who else is on the pulpit that Sunday morning or the bigger fish is we have a big enemy. We all have the same enemy. And, you know, he's here to corrupt the world and our neighbors and our family and our friends and children. And, you know, we have a responsibility to them to try. Right. And collectively try for each other. And, the, and there's a world out there that's dying that, that is seeking this. They, they, they don't know what it is, but the spirit is in there calling out, deep mm -hmm. calls out to deep. It's in there, it's just that they don't know how to, they're searching for it. That's why there's so many religions that there, people go into philosophy and, and, and use drugs to reach another level of uh, consciousness. But it's because they're searching. They're searching that light and, and, and that's our call. To, to be out of that light and, and teach him about this. Well, we're to be that light and all these people that are searching end up going to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. That's right. We've got to turn them back to the tree of life. I wanna read the rest of Psalm 133 here. It, it talks about how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the, on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. And what is the blessing? Life forevermore, Amen. eternal life. Mm -hmm. All right, my point, unity is directly related to life. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can't have life until there's unity. And back in the beginning, the Creator told us this. He formed man, He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then he said, you know what? It's not good for man to be alone. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make him a helpmate. Right. Ezer Kenegdo. Uh, some people even render it a help opposite. A help opposite, not just like him. Right. Now, he created the man with certain strengths. He created the woman with certain strengths. Mm -hmm. right. And theoretically, the man can go his way. He's that ministry that can go do things his way and not even have anything to do with this minister over here. And she can go do her thing, and they can exist right. apart from one another, but they cannot produce life of course. until they come together mm -hmm. as one. She's different than he is. Women look at things differently than men do, right? Mm -hmm. Right, totally mm -hmm. differently, in a way that men would never ever think of. And the same is true for how you know, we are compared mm -hmm. to women. Right. And that's the way the Creator made us. But He also designed it that as husband and wife, we come together to be one flesh. You don't stop being a woman when you married your husband and he didn't stop being a man. You're unique in that way. But you committed yourself in covenant to become one. And only when two come together as one is it possible for there to be life. Now, <clears throat> let me add this little uh, footnote, you know, we live in a world where people are saying that it's lawful for two of the same sex to become one. Okay, biblically, that doesn't hold water, right. okay? But <clears throat> the point here, biblically, is not if two of the same sex love one another, because apparently there are situations where they do. Right. However, the purpose, the function of marriage is to produce life. Right be fruitful and multiply, two of the same can't do that. Correct. Impossible, never gonna happen. They can adopt, they can have surrogates, they can do artificial insemination, blah, 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 fine. You know, that's, that's your thing, <laughs> okay? But two of the same cannot produce life. Right. And so 
I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and we're talking about God's design here. Right. And again, his greater purpose. That's right. You know, not our <clears throat> personal desires or vendetta. It's, it's his kingdom. Well, if in the natural, it takes two, not of the same, not uniform, opposite. but opposites. Right. It takes two that have a different perspective of things to come together in order to produce life. What does that say about people who think, well, you have to see things my way. Mm -hmm. You have to do it my way, say it my way, celebrate it my way, or else right. I can't have any relationship with you. It's basically saying, I want uniformity. Right. Mm -hmm. You gotta be the same. That will not produce life. Now, I wanna be very careful that people not misconstrue what I'm saying. We're talking about people who are of faith. We are talking yes. about people who have accepted the Messiah. We're talking about people who are, who truly want to serve God. They just may mm -hmm. not see things the way you and I see them right mm -hmm. now, okay? So I wanna qualify this statement. But again, two of the same won't produce life. And if it doesn't produce life, by default, what does it render? Corruption. Death. Mm -hmm. And he's not God of the dead, he's God of the living. Amen. Amen. What, I hope I won't get in trouble saying this, but I think it's becoming obvious to many. If the quote unquote Hebrew roots slash messianic slash Torah observant community doesn't realize that we need one another, right. and if they don't realize that people in churches are not our enemy, they are our brethren. Amen, amen. If we don't come to realize it, it won't be too much longer Hebrew roots, Messianic, whatever you want to call it, will die. Even yeah. Christianity, I mean, yeah. in a bigger picture. Religion. Religion. That's right. Religion will render death. So <clears throat> in the beginning, we see this pattern, how two that are, I mean, they're, they're related. Right. Mm -hmm. They have something in common, but they're unique. And it requires those two to come together as one in order that there might be life. And life is connected to the concept of unity. The Father and the Son are one, one in the other. And he said, I want them to be one and be one in us. You know why? Because unless we are, there is no life. There's existence, but there's no life. And one last thought. Psalm 133, I would suggest to you, is, is what's said there is even the context of the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and study the history of how those 12 tribes come to be, you will find jealousy, envy, dysfunction, greed. suspicion, greed, mm -hmm. hatred, disagreement, war, strife, all these things. They're all unique. Right. And yet their king calls them to be one. In fact, there's coming a day, Zechariah said, in that day there will be one king and his name Echad, one. You see, whatever he is, that's what you and I are supposed to be. He's mm -hmm. the son of God. We are being conformed to the image of the son of God. He's the seed of Abraham. If we're his, we're supposed to be the seed of Abraham. If he is Echad, we're supposed to be Echad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not uniform, not necessarily seeing everything exactly the same way, but yet because we are in covenant with him, we agreed we need to come together in unity. Right. We pray that this program blessed you today. We look forward to seeing you next week with a brand new series here on Shabbat Night Live. Uh, but contact us should you have any questions. And, and hopefully this is an enlightenment to you and your fellowship, to you and your home and your family. Thank you for joining us.